Hi, my name is Lydia Stetson, and welcome to Connecting Voices, a TV show dedicated to producing news on social justice issues. Today we're going to talk about the overlook of Asian American feminist issues, in specifically communities of Caucasian feminism and also overall um, women of color feminist circles. Um, we have Jen Fang, the founder of Reappropriate.co, a blog, and Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> so um, could you, I guess, like first introduce your blog and what's it about and mm -hmm. things like that? Sure. So um, I've been running Reappropriate for about, I think this is my 13th year at the end of the year. Um, I began the blog when I was a, a sophomore or a junior in college. And it was at the time when blogging was a very big deal in terms of generating discourse and creating um, political identity and political activism. The internet was a really important organizing tool. Um, but when I went online, and, and I was already online sort of con um, talking a little bit about Asian American activism, but when I went online I actually found that there weren't that many Asian American feminist blogs. In fact, there weren't any when I did my Google search. And so I decided to create Reappropriate as a space where we could um, really try to develop Asian American feminism as um, a sort of a political movement and also a way to advance the identity of Asian American women. Cool. So um, I'd like to start off the show by first um, reading out loud a quote um, an Asian American feminist, Lindsay Yu, did with NPR. So she told the reporter, I've been told since high school that Asian Americans are not relevant, that our voices and experiences matter only when high schoolers turn their pages to the obligatory paragraphs in their world history readers that briefly address Chinese railroad workers. The Asian American experience, despite spanning several generations of struggle and oppression, is rendered invisible. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on this quote? Do you agree or disagree? So, um, I think that that quote really resonates with a lot of Asian American youth, and I think it speaks to the experiences of many young people that I've spoken to, and it spoke to, it speaks to my own experiences growing up as well. I think um, a lot of Asian American youth find that our histories and our identities are largely absent from the classrooms, and even when we are um, taught in the classrooms, it's a very um, superficial and sort of one-dimensional representation of the broad diversity of Asian American politics in Asian American history. You know, um, this quote that you mentioned speaks specifically about um, the history of Chinese Americans on the Transcontinental Railroad, which is an extremely important moment within Asian American history. But I think also within that, there's a lot that's not spoken about within, uh, in regard to Asian Americans. So when Chinese American laborers were helping to build the Transcontinental Railroad. This was a time, for example, when um, Chinese American women and Asian American women in general had already, um, we were largely unable to enter into the country. So if the only um, historical moment that's taught in classrooms is this one aspect, you're already not speaking about Asian American women and our entry into America because we're talking about a moment when Asian American women were largely absent. Um, also, that's a moment that pretty much excludes the experiences of Korean Americans, Japanese Americans, and Southeast Asian Americans, and South Asian Americans. So when this one moment, which is very important in our history, becomes representative of our entire experiences, we're missing out on so many stories that speak to so many other different people. Mm. Why do you think they exclude so much of our history? Then? I don't think it's necessarily a deliberate thing. Um, within the classrooms, I think that there's a pressure to try and teach many different stories and many different perspectives. And I think too often within classrooms, the curricula that deal with diversity in general, not just Asian Americans, but all people of color, that history is very limited. Um, and it's always very superficial. Like you have Black History Month, when that's the only time we learn about black history, black literature and black politics. Um, Asian American History Month is really the only time that they ever really deal with these very superficial levels of Asian American history. So I think that rather than it being sort of a deliberate, deliberate thing, I think it's just the way that we sort of approach people of color history is very faceted and, and sort of um, limited to this one moment in time in the curriculum that we teach it rather than integrating it throughout how we teach history in general. So I think that if um, if we went deeper into our history and sort of talked about American history more multiculturally, I think we could um, touch on many more of these moments within our history and not um, focus on just one or two representative moments that aren't truly representative of our experiences. Mm, definitely. So what would you say are those moments and also those struggles that Asian Americans face that, as Lindsay, you said, what are rendered invisible? Mm -hmm. Well, so I think what um, we've mentioned a little bit here are um, 
you know, the, the Chinese American laborers on the Transcontinental Railroad is definitely an important moment in our history, but it's a historical moment and it doesn't really deal with more of the contemporary politics of Asian Americans and Asian American women in particular. So we don't really talk about immigration issues and how, for example, current fights to try and reform the immigration system within this country is something that impacts Asian Americans very strongly as it impacts many people of color, many other communities of color. Um, we don't deal with um, stereotypes, both historical and contemporary, that Asian Americans have faced. Um, we don't deal with, as I mentioned, the diasporic nature of Asian American, the Asian American identity. And so, again, I think what's really rendered invisible are the, the histories and the narratives of um, Southeast Asian American refugees, um, Pacific Islanders, and Native Hawaiians. And those are basically just completely untouched in the classrooms. So I think that um, that's just a little bit of the stuff that we don't really talk about. Mm -hmm. And so for those contemporary and historical stereotypes you were talking about, for our viewers, like what would those stereotypes look like? In terms of women or in general? Um, Asian American women. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I think one of the, the sort of historical tidbits that they don't really teach in classrooms is how Asian American women came to enter into the United States. Um, for Unfortunately, many Asian American women were imported either as laborers or alternatively as um, sex workers. And I think that those stereotypes persist um, into today. The idea of the hypersexualized, objectified Asian American woman um, has a historical context and still is um, a part of how um, Asian American women are perceived today as um, sort of abnormally sexualized. And so that's one thing that they don't really talk about in, in classrooms and they don't really contextualize that within American history. Um, I think also another thing that um, stereotypically, we, we talked about laborers, Asian American women were, um, when they came over, they came over as um, lower skilled laborers. And one of the stereotypes there is that we're meek, that we're hardworking, and that we basically don't really strive to stand up for ourselves. And I think that ignores um, a very long history of Asian Americans, and specifically Asian American women, who have um, worked very tirelessly within the labor movement, um, specifically thousands of Asian American women organized throughout the 20th century as garment workers to try and fight for better wages for themselves and better working conditions. And that's another thing, another aspect of Asian American history that's not really taught. Mm. So I guess like in, especially in the conversation of Asian American fe feminism, um, I found this um, part that it keeps on showing up in different articles and I felt it was really captured in this quote from uh, The Feminist Wire, an article Grace G. Sun Kim did. She says, um, this deafening silencing may be due in part to society's acceptance of Asian Americans as the model minority. This concept of model minority is a myth based on the faulty misconception that since Asian Americans work hard and have succeeded, they must not have suffered the difficulties and hardships of racism, prejudice, and stereotyping as the other ethnic communities. So I felt like that really was kind of discussing what you were talking about before. Mm -hmm. So can you, I guess, do you have your own personal definition of a model, a model minority based on how other people right. have viewed you as? So the model minority myth, um, it's one of the central issues for Asian Americans. Um, and I think, again, we talked earlier um, about needing to contextualize things in history. The model minority myth emerges in the 1960s as a direct reaction to the civil rights movement um, as a way to um, speak against um, black political uplift by elevating Asian Americans as the model minority, the people who were hardworking and ambitious and therefore were able to overcome racism by pulling themselves up by the bootstraps. So when it comes to the model minority, the idea that Asian Americans are well behaved and therefore not politically assertive, for me that's what the model minority myth really represents, this idea that we won't fight for our own rights and that we'll just keep our heads down and um, do, you know, behave well and not kick up too much of a fuss. Um, and I think that the part of the quote that you cited, that it's very faulty, um, the model minority myth is entirely a myth. It ignores um, so many complex aspects of the Asian American community in our history, how we arrived in this country. Um, the model minority myth arises by ignoring how immigration impacts the Asian American community. Um, with immigration, those who 
immigrate um, through documented status um, arrive typically either as students trying to attend college or because they have job offers. And so the Asian American community is a very filtered community, one where we've been selected through immigration um, to have better economic earning potential than other communities. And so when the model minority myth simply ignores this aspect of the Asian American community and just assumes that um, these factors like our earning potential can be directly compared to other communities like the black community or the Latino community um, where the effect of immigration isn't quite so stark. And so I think that when we talk about the model minority myth, the reason why Asian Americans are very adamant that we need to dismantle this myth is because it's a stereotype that ignores who Asian Americans are and the very specific experiences and narratives that are, allow for us to be in this country. And I think the other issue of the model minority myth is, again, we've talked about the diversity of the Asian American community. And um, one of the things that people who cite the myth fail to acknowledge is that there are many Asian Americans within the larger community that are really struggling, for whom um, high economic earning potential is not true. So again, we can talk about um, Southeast Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who do not have high median family incomes, who don't have high rates of graduating from college. And when we talk about the model minority myth, we're simply rendering those people completely invisible. Mm, yeah. So I guess like when you were talking about how in the model minority, Asian Americans are conceived as um, being like behaving well, how does that affect, I guess, Asian Americans' relationship to the American legal system, like specifically police brutality? Um, so that's a really interesting um, facet, and I think it's very timely, right, given where we are right now. Um, I think that, again, this is a myth of the Asian Americans as well behaved. The model minority myth comes in the 1960s. It's really popularly embraced in the 1980s. But between the 1960s and the 1980s, few people know this, but Asian Americans um, we were concentrated in ethnic enclaves and we were highly racially profiled as well as gangsters and hoodlums and thugs and there were many, many, many incidents incidents of Asian Americans facing police brutality and it was one of the uniting issues for the Asian American community to speak out against police brutality and racial profiling. Um, there, there are um, photographs by an Asian American historian and photographer named Corky Lee. And at the time, he traveled across the nation and documented these protests from San Francisco to New York City of thousands of Asian Americans taking to the streets protesting police brutality. And what I find really sad um, about the way that our history is not taught in classrooms these days is that there's very little memory of those examples today. And so the idea that Asian Americans are well behaved and that we won't speak out against police brutality, I think is, it, it just ignores that history. Mm, yeah. So I guess like, would you say police brutality against Asian Americans, is that still existent today? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that there are several incidents, I've got some on my blog, where um, I've told the stories of Asian Americans who continue to be um, brutalized by Asian American, or by police. Um, and sometimes racial profiling seems to be part of the story. Um, and I think that the problem is those stories don't really make it to the headlines. And so we're not entire, um, the mainstream media is not always elevating those stories so that people can be aware of how Asian Americans are very, very energized against police brutality and racial profiling and how this is a major issue for us as well. Um, you know, before the latest incidents um, or concurrent with these incidents, there are also incidents of Asian Americans actually also being killed by police. Um, about five or seven years ago, for example, in I think it was Minnesota, a Hmong American named Fong Lee was um, shot and killed by a Minnesota police officer. And it appears as if he might have been unarmed at the time and shot in the back. And security um, surveillance footage shows this entire thing happening. But unfortunately, that story never really made it into the mainstream media. and the fight to try and bring justice for Fong Lee never really made it into um, progressive circles. And so that story becomes lost. I guess speaking about current events and what's been on the news, a year ago, the hashtag Not Your Asian Sidekick um, Twitter conversation appeared. So we're going to watch a video talking about that.
Now, it began with a Chicago-based activist tweeting about how Asian women are stereotyped in the US and soon the hashtag not your Asian psychic sparked a global debate about the way Asian men and women are treated and portrayed. Well, the online conversation started by Sui Park has been picked up by tens of thousands of people on Twitter who are using it as a platform to vent their frustrations. Well, Charlotte Whale is live for us in the world's newsroom with more. Charlotte, over to you. Hi, John. OK, we're here with the BBC trending team who've been following this conversation closely online. And presenter Anne-Marie Tomczak is with me now, and she's actually been speaking to Sui Park. So tell me what she had to say. Oh, Sui told me why she started this hashtag. She was having a conversation with her female friends who felt like they really didn't have their voices heard. Um, why it was The hashtag really was started as a critique of white feminism and how it doesn't adequately incorporate the issues that Asian women feel. And it's been already tweeted about 56,000 times, primarily in the United States. And uh, when you look within the United States, it's actually primarily in California and New York. Um, and I think part of the reason Sui did this was because she felt that there were a lot of stereotypes that existed about uh, the Asian community as a silent minority, uh, that they don't feature within the debate about race relations in the United States, but also that there are so many stereotypes about them, that they're docile and submissive and hard workers. And one of the things that really struck me when I went through the tweets was that a lot of Asian women started to tweet about their own body image and how they felt pressures to conform to an expectation that people had of them. And we spoke to Sui about that. Developed an eating disorder at a really early age. And so I internalized, you know, things I saw on TV, things that people would say to me in my Korean church, things that my white classmates would say about me and my body. Even if the representation of women is changing in mainstream America, it's really not changing for Asian American women. People think that eating disorders only happen to white women. Right, now's a good time to bring in Carol Yarwood. She's from our BBC Chinese service. Now, Carol, what do you make of all this? Are you surprised that it's getting so much traction online, particularly in the US? Um, actually, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, this is a very interesting topic. It's time someone uh, came out and say something about it. Uh, but then again, uh, I think we all have stereotypes, you know, uh, just like uh, Anne-Marie Tomczak just said, Asian women, uh, we are talking about East Asian women here, really. Um, like being quiet, being um, petite, being submissive. Uh, but I think, I think one of the reasons may be because uh, she's frustrated because, you know, Asian women's voice are not being heard. I think probably because there's not... Asian women still very small amount of minority in the US. And do you, and do you identify with this as an Asian woman in Britain? Uh, I think, yeah, it's similar situation. I mean, again, uh, like in the USA, like uh, Asian people here, again, it's a very small amount of minority compared to other uh, big groups of like uh, uh, black Africans and other uh, unique immigrants group. So uh, I think it's also how the media portrays the, the, the Asian woman. So you can identify with the... So, um, what were your thoughts on the video and also uh, the hashtag not your Asian sidekick Twitter conversation overall? Well, I did really quickly want to disagree with one aspect of that video, which was the idea that Asian Americans or Asian American women are a very small minority in this country. Um, we are about, I think, five to six percent of the country at this time, but we're also either one of the fastest or the fastest growing minority community in the country, depending on the year that you're looking. Um, and we're growing at such a rapid rate that I think that it would be very hard to characterize us as a very tiny minority. And one of the things that I didn't particularly like about the segment was the idea that we're so small that this is like a brand new thing that um, folks are discovering for the first time. Asian American feminism has been around for, you know, 50 years at this point. And so one of the great things about Not Your Asian Sidekick, I think, as a Twitter hashtag was how it sort of brought mainstream attention to Asian American feminism in a way that I think was unseen before. Um, we'd never really had that kind of a spotlight as a political movement. And so it was a really great opportunity to sort of present ourselves, present what we think and, and what we believe in, and most, most importantly, the many issues politically um, and, and personally, like what Sui Park talks about with her body image issues, that Asian American women face. So I think it was a really great moment in Asian American feminist discourse that brought in a lot of really great ideas and really great voices.
Mm. So what would you say about the fact that like BBC, a um, dominant media, trying to report on some on a political movement and then just ending up messing it all up actually <laughs> well i think that that's again indicative of how um, race politics in general is treated in these largely non-diverse mainstream outlets like um, we all know that news media and, and media in general is predominantly male dominated, it's predominantly white dominated. And when you don't have people of color in the newsroom able to sort of say, this is how we should frame this story, these are the voices we should include to try and bring a meaningful context to this story, I think you end up with a segment like that where it seemed a little bit as if they pulled the one Asian American or Asian British employee they had in the office and asked her what she thought about, you know, politics across the pond. Um, and that I thought was a little bit unfortunate. I think they could have done a little bit better than that. Um, so in that regard, I think it's nice that we had an opportunity to, to bring the conversation to the foreground. But frankly, I've always been someone who prefers independent media outlets, kind of like this one, where um, we can really be part of the, the, the debate and really present our ideas. Um, in our own way, empowered by ourselves with our own agency, rather than filtered through the lens of media that doesn't normally include or represent us. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, when we look more into the feminist feminist circles and like woman of color, Caucasian woman, Asian American woman, all these different kinds. So overall, we generally as women have the same goals, you know, reproductive justice mm -hmm. and like workplace justice not being sexualized. So why is it that, you know, Asian Americans seem to be so excluded in the conversation, would you say? I think that in general, again, the, the history of Asian American feminism is as old as feminisms of any other color, um, any other community of color. Um, and so I think it's been very unfortunate and to watch Asian American women. I agree. We, we aren't as included in the conversations, particularly amount around women of color feminism, as I think we could be. Um, and I think that part of it, again, has to do with a lack of awareness of Asian American politics and Asian American history. The idea that we're not outspoken, I think, allows people to overlook Asian American feminists and the kind of work that we do. Um, in terms of reproductive justice, I think it's a major issue for Asian American feminists, and I think it's very unfortunate that we've been largely excluded from the conversation. Um, just in this past year, for example, um, laws that, um, as um, the Republican right is starting their fight uh, to um, try and limit access to abortion, um, what we've found is that one of the major battlegrounds that they've tried to establish to fight against and ultimately um, make abortion access illegal um, is to target um, immigrant women and particularly Asian American women um, and criminalize miscarriages um, in states like I believe it was Indiana recently. Um, so there's a story, um, the case of Pervy Patel who um, suffered a miscarriage um, in I believe her second trimester of pregnancy and um, she ultimately was convicted of um, feticide within Indiana and she was an Asian American woman who is now facing a prison sentence basically for um, suffering a miscarriage of, of her fetus. Mm -hmm. um, and what's unfortunate is that particular story is a very important issue for the fight for reproductive justice and yet I think that there remains a disconnect between reproductive justice advocates and Asian American activists and immigrant right, rights advocates um, in finding a connection on this story. I mean, we really should be working together around this one story because it sort of intersects with everything that all three of us care about. And yet I think that um, there hasn't been a much interest in creating that larger intersectional activism. Mm -hmm. So I guess, how would youth in general then, how would they combat just like the interjection of racism in feminism, like how do we stop that division and start unifying? How do youth deal with it? <laughs> well, I think that the internet has been a really profound space for learning and communicating with other people. And you know, every day I hear stories about people who have used the internet to really sophisticate their own politics. And so I think the first step for youth is to really 
you know, use the internet as a tool to learn about all facets of your own politics, not just your race, but also your gender and your sexuality and your able is your able-bodiedness and all of that kind of thing and really get a sense of yourself as not just one facet of yourself but all facets and then take that um, what we call intersectional um, approach to your own politics and represent that in whatever social justice space you're at so you know if you're in a room that's full of feminists don't be afraid to bring in what your experiences as a person of color and how that influences your feminism because those spaces haven't most likely have not heard that story before and so I think that it, one thing that what we're trying to do is tr encourage youth to not be afraid to make the conversation a little bit more complicated by saying yes I'm a feminist but I'm also a feminist of color and that really matters and I can't divorce my feminism from my race activism it's just my politics it's just one thing and so I hope any youth who are watching this will you know take the time to learn and really think about all aspects of themselves and find the courage to you know try to integrate very um, different ideas of who they are into the spaces that they're in hmm. and for the youth out there because a lot of the times feminism unfortunately seems to have a really bad connotation at times people mm -hmm. don't understand it mm -hmm. and so a lot of youth are sort of tentative of whether or not they are feminists so I guess in order to help them what was your moment where you realized you were a feminist uh, when I realized I was a feminist um, I think that so we talked a little bit earlier about um, childhood experiences. Um, I think one thing that as an Asian American woman I experienced as a child was um, just the different treatment that Asian American women face growing up in um, our households where it's traditionally fairly um, patriarchal and male dominated um, and compared to male cousins or, or male brothers, um, Asian American women are deprioritized just culturally and socially. Do you have any um, final things that you'd like to say to youth or just to anyone? Um, I think uh, um, Asian American feminism really has been suffering from not having a lot of focus and awareness and a chance to really talk about the issues that we face. And I think that this has been a really great conversation, hopefully just to get um, people starting to think about Asian American feminism and to start talking. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Lydia Stetson, and thank you so much for watching Connecting Voices. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes. <laughs>